Welcome to Christ Fellowship Eastside. I'm Pastor Chastine, one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship. We want to welcome you this morning. So we're excited. We want to make much of Jesus this morning. We're going to worship and make much of Him throughout the day and throughout this, this time together. So a couple things. Uh, we exist to multiply disciples to the glory of God. That's why we're here on the east side of Greenville. We want to make much of Jesus. And we want to multiply disciples and send them out. We want God to fill us up so we can send out. And one of the things I want to encourage you to do if you're new with us or really if you've been with us for a few weeks and there's a way that we can pray for you, we'd love for you to fill out one of these Connect cards. You can find them on the, on the bottom of the seat in front of you. But the pastors, we meet every Tuesday, and we would like to have an opportunity to pray for you. So if there's something going on or if there's just a praise report, we want to be thankful to the Lord as well. So please take a moment and fill those out. You can give it to me, you can give it to Phil, or you can put it in the offering box in the back. But again, we'd love to pray for you. And then uh, before we get started, I want to read Psalm 95 for us this morning. It says, Come, let's shout joyfully to the Lord, shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let's enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let's shout triumphantly to him in song. And so I'm going to pray for us, and then Brent is going to lead us as we make much of Jesus this morning. God, thankful for your goodness, for your grace and your kindness to us. We thank you for the finished work of Jesus through the cross and the resurrection, and our hope is in him. Pray that we would make a loud and joyful noise and and sing praise to you to make much of you this morning. We love you. We're thankful you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church family. Would you stand together as we sing this morning? In Christ alone, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving my all in all, here in the love of Christ I'll stand, amen. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. On the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground His body lay, the light of the world by dark. have hope this morning because of Christ, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It's all about him. And we'll sing, what gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace.
the gift of praise is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark. But I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will amen. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power. I want to read this morning from Ephesians chapter 2. It says, And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And this was our condition before Christ. This is the human condition, that we walk according to the desires of our flesh, that we fulfill the desires of our heart, that we are walking in a direction very opposite of God. That's just the nature that was in us. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. We're going to sing that truth, that gospel narrative that says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were alone in our sorrows without hope, with, with no hope of saving us on our own strength. But God, because of his grace and the love that he had for us, sent his son to us so that we can stand today free because of him. We'll sing together, death was arrested.
Are you thankful for the cross of Calvary this morning? Amen. Would you pray with me? God, we love you so much. We're thankful for salvation. We're thankful that though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you sent your son to die for us so that we can have life, so that we can have freedom and freedom to serve you, freedom to love you, freedom to know you. And Lord, this morning, would we exercise that freedom and pursue you as we look into your word? Would you become real to us in ways that we uh, have not seen before? And would we just be drawn to your heart this morning because of your spirit's work through the word? And it's in your name we pray this morning. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. Chris, if you come now. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Carson, and uh, I'm here to tell you uh, how I came to Christ and uh, background on how we came, my wife and I, my family came to Christ Fellowship Eastside. So I was actually saved when I was uh, very young. I was eight years old. I am the youngest of five uh, in my family. And um, through events, uh, my parents divorced, um, and my family went from five to two, just my mom and I, within about three months. And it was during that time that um, being young, I didn't understand everything that was going on around me, and my heart became hard. And for there was about there was a window of 13 years where I drifted, um, and I did things that I shouldn't have done. I joined the military. That wasn't one of them. <laughs> but the military did influence me to do, you know, to, to drift even farther. Um, I got out of the military, was, was, you know, just drifting, just did, you know, not knowing what to do, what direction. But God had a plan for me. Uh, I ran into my future wife at uh, Greenville Tech, and uh, she invited me to church. And I was like, well, you know, this is cool. I wanted to be close to her. <laughs> so I went to church with her. And uh, the, the pastor that, that, um, that was preaching at this church, he humbled himself and was talking about his sins and how he struggled. And I don't know, as a, as a young adult, I think that was the first time I'd heard of a pastor struggling. And that really brought me back. Uh, that was the, the, the beginning of, of me coming back to Christ. And it, it's been a journey. It was a journey. It's, well, it's always a journey. So, um, you know, it was, you know, God has been good to me. He's been faithful. My journey was, was different from everybody else's journey that I know. Um, but God is good. So how did, how did Michelle and I come to uh, Christ Fellowship? Well, we were attending a church that had total lockdown and doing sermons online. You know, the first week or two, that was okay. <laughs> but then um, Michelle, my sweet wife, said, you know what? I'm going to go start looking for somewhere else. And I was still like, no, nah, we're going to, I want to, you know, I don't want to drift away from, from the church. Uh, but she came back and said, hey, there's this, there's this gathering. It's a small church and it, meeting at Eastside Industrial, Eastern. Eastern Industrial, and uh, it's about a little over a year ago now. It was October of uh, 2020. So we, uh, she started. She went once or twice, and and I came back. I went with her, and uh, and this is this is where we've stayed ever since. And um, I appreciate the the staff here. Uh, God has blessed us, looking around from where we started over a year ago. Uh, God has blessed us with, with people coming in, visitors, and uh, you know, God is good. Thank you. I appreciate Chris letting us put him on the spot this morning, uh, ask him to share that testimony. And, and Chris, we're just grateful for you and your, your willingness to jump in and serve and volunteer around here and even, even just share this morning with us. Um, and so it's, it's a blessing seeing how God has shaped and, and moved in the church to, to grow us in so many ways, uh, but, but most significantly, not just uh, in, in our location and our numbers, but also just seeing the, 
the spiritual growth that you know, even as be, being able to share times with Chris and, and hear, hear how God's working in his life and working in his family and uh, growing and, and shaping him. It's, it's just, it's so encouraging, you know, just seeing how God is, God is working through all these seemingly small relationships through this, this body of believers that's gathered together to, to help us take those next steps in our walk with God. Um, so I'm, I'm Phil, one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship Eastside. Glad that you all have joined us this morning to worship God, make much of Him, uh, and, and as well take those, take those small steps in our Christian walk. Um, so, so this morning we're starting our series on Advent. Uh, Advent is just kind of that, that longing, that looking forward to what, um, what Je- Jesus coming, uh, that kind of uh, stirring our, our longings for Him. And so we're, we're doing that through a number of passages that don't necessarily include that manger scene, uh, and, and the, the baby born at Christmas time, but actually point toward that baby of Christmas that, that we, we want to remind ourselves during the season. So we're looking at a number of passages. This, this week was supposed to be Toby's passage, uh, but he is sick, not with the COVIDs, but some kind of other mystery illness that is, is causing him to to, uh, you know, lay out a church this morning. So I, I hope all of you who have his number can just all at one time text him this morning and just wish him well, wish him a speedy recovery. And so with that, I got, got that uh, call on Friday to uh, go ahead and, and start hustling. So uh, we, I, I'm looking at Philippians chapter 2 this morning. And uh, just have to admit as well that this, this morning's uh, message, this, this morning's text, is not your typical light and fluffy Christmas text, okay? We'll just go ahead and be honest with that. Um, it, it, is, it, it is a text that is full of uh, deep theology, profound theology. It has a profound message for us as well in how we should live our lives. And it would be one of those passages that would be really easy to avoid, especially at Christmas time, especially when we have visitors and people who are with us or, you know, checking out the church and trying to understand what we're all about. You know, we should probably preach those nice, uh, you know, baby Jesus sermons during this time that, that are a little bit easier to, to handle, but, but we're actually going to look at some really deep theology, some really thick stuff. But I think that's important that we not steer around that stuff. We go right into it and, and enjoy the complexity, enjoy the challenge and see how that applies to our lives, see how that shapes and affects our lives. So turn with me, Philippians chapter 2 is toward the end of your Bible in these letters, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. If you hit Colossians, back it up. Philippians chapter 2, we'll start in verse 5 and go down through verse 11. It says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we look at this passage, we're going to see two things this morning. Uh, normally, I have at least three things, so, so you should be thinking, wow, Phil's going to get done early, but I'm, I'm not, um, because point number one is going to be pretty long, and then point number two will be short, I promise. I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so two things this morning. First, we need a divine human Savior and secondly, we need a humbled, exalted Savior. That, that, that's the message of this passage for us, the burden of the text for us this morning as we look at it. And so we'll look, first of all, at the, the implications of, of a divine human Savior that we see in this text. First of all, we see His deity just shining out through this passage. Verse 6, it says, Who, talking about Jesus, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Um, we'll, we'll just dive right into this. So, so this idea, the form of God, immediately conjures up for us, well, maybe Jesus looked like God. He was similar to God, but He was not God. And so that, that's something that maybe as we first look at this text that we might walk away with. 
but, but I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, steer right into the, the challenge. So, so that word form in your, in your Bible, sometimes uh, some of you may have a translation who, that will say something like that Jesus being in the very nature God. And why would, why would that be? Why, why would some translators kind of take that liberty with it? And I think it's a good liberty to take with that word. Well, the, the word for form is, is the word morphe, which in the for the Greek recipients of this letter would have immediately triggered some thoughts. And those thoughts would have come probably from the philosophers of the day who love to talk about morphes, forms. Um, so if, if you've ever taken a college philosophy class or done any reading in philosophy, you probably are familiar with this guy named Plato, not Plato, Plato, sorry. Um, so for you kids, that's it's different. Um, so Plato had this idea of, uh, you, you may have heard of this idea of this cave, and he said that we're all like people trapped in the back of this cave, kind of chained facing the back wall of this cave, and what we see around us, all these material things, the chairs, the people in the room, the building that we're in, are like these shadows projected on the wall in front of us. All of material reality, all the tangible stuff, the stuff that your five senses can interact with, are like these projections on the back wall of the cave. And they're not even projections of real things. They're like cardboard cutouts that are kind of being walked back and forth in front of this fire that is kind of causing these shadows to appear. And that's the material world around us. And so his idea of philosophy was like, if, if you could then break away from those chains and then go kind of toward the light and, and up through this, this cave and up through this cavern, you could work your way back up to the surface uh, of the earth and begin to see what they called the morphes, the forms, the, the real things that exist behind and in back of all the physical stuff that we see around us. And this is, this is the kind of language that the philosophers of the day of Paul would have used and talked about uh, realities, things that, that are, are deep. So when we talk about what it means to be human, they would say, well, that's a morphe, that's a form. Uh, it's, e I can talk to each of you, and each one of you is human. It's a, uh, there, there's a very ma material representation, a, a material aspect to that, but there's something far deeper behind that, of what it means to be human. And in a same, similar way, Paul is using that same language and kind of twisting it a little bit and saying, you know, there is something that it, what it means to be God that exists far beyond the reaches of our intellect, far beyond the reaches of, of what we can really see and, and touch and taste and feel and, and, and subject to our senses, that there is something about God that transcends all of that. So if we look at what the very nature of what God is, the very sum total of His essence that we can't put our hands on in this life, well, that's what Jesus is. Jesus is God's very nature made visible to us. And we're going to get to that in a moment. So not to, not to overly complexify, but that's, that's the kind of language that Paul's using. He's saying, if, if you want to get to the real essence of who God is, that's Jesus made visible to us. Uh, he says that, uh, that if, if you look down at the next phrase, existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Some of your translations may maybe say something like to, to be grasped at, to be reached for or, or wielded in some way. So, so Jesus is, is essentially saying I, he, he is equal with God, but He doesn't need to wield that as a weapon. He is, he is equal. To, he's no demigod. He's no Thor for you Marvel fans out there. He's, he's no half God. He's no second class God. He is God. He is equal with God. He didn't have to fight for it. He isn't like, uh, we're going we're gonna to look at this in a moment, but, but he's not like the humans in the garden who are saying, I want to I grasp after the, the kind of knowledge and the kind of attributes that God has. He doesn't have to do that because he's already got it. He's already equal with God. He, he already has everything that he needs. He doesn't need to take his shot. He's got it. And then the next phrase, uh, he instead, verse 7 emptied himself. What does this mean? That, this, that phrase has uh, taken tons of ink has been spilled on. What, what, what does this mean that Jesus emptied himself? 
What did he empty himself of? Did he empty himself of his godness? Did he empty himself of his attributes? What did he empty himself of? And the, and the text is intentionally vague. Uh, it doesn't say what he emptied out of himself. He just says he emptied himself and, and then shows us what that means. It says emptied himself how? By doing what? By adding, by assuming the form of a servant. To, for God to add something to himself is actually to subtract from himself. Isn't that a mind-blowing thought? To, to add something to himself, he's actually subtracting from himself. God is, God is the only being that we can say that about. And so Jesus, by assuming human flesh, by taking on the form of a servant, the morphe of a servant, two morphes in one person, um, this, is, this is where it sparked all of these creeds and confessions that talks about the two natures of, of Jesus, both human and divine, in one person. Um, he, he, is, he is emptying himself. He is deflating himself in some way um, and reduced by addition. And then the next thing it says is taking on the likeness of humanity. Now, that may lead us to assume something like, well, he just looked like humans. He kind of looked like us, but he isn't really one of us. But that's, that's not the point of the passage. The point of the passage is saying, you know, not only did he take on humanity, not only did he take on what the real essence of what it means to be human really is, that, that, that thing that transcends all, all of us as humans, that human nature, but he did it in such a way that you never would have known that he was God. You never would have known by looking at him he wore some kind of halo or had some kind of glow about his skin. And you, you know what? The, the only time you ever saw that veil kind of drop a little bit was on that mountain, right? And he's got Peter, James, and John around him. And all of a sudden, it says his clothes began to glow and his face begins to glow. And, and Moses and Elijah show up there alongside of him. And you finally get to see that form of God that, that is, has been merged there with the form of a servant in a, in a way that we can't, can't even begin to fully decipher, uh, though, though helpfully we've had many Christian theologians who've, who've helped us wrestle through that. Um, so, so he really became just like us. He looked like us. He, he walked like us. He got sick like us. He, he, he had relationships just like us. There's, there's so much about him that, that is absolutely like our experiences. And that's Jesus, the form of God in the form of a servant. Now, hopefully, you're, you're looking at all this and, and the, the philosophy and all this, this stuff and going, whoa, like this is, again, a lot to take in. This is, this is a ton of information. We've gotten really into the weeds with a bunch of words and, and hopefully not too confusing for us. But, but say, like, there's a lot in here that we could just take weeks, months to unpack. In fact, our, our sister sending church across town is literally spending the entire Christmas season unpacking this passage phrase by phrase by phrase each week. Uh, so there's a ton in here. And I would encourage you, take time this week to spend time wrestling with what this means and, and the, the implications of this passage. But I want to zoom out and make, make a few, two big picture implications from this. If, if we zoom out from all the weeds and, and all this data that, that we've just looked at, take a 30,000-foot view, we're going to see two things about this passage. First, I want to emphasize the historicity of the divine human Jesus. Around this time of year, you'll probably be able to pick up a number of documentaries, uh, flip on the TV or, or on, on, on an app, and watch a lot of stuff about Christmas, about Jesus, because it's something the secular world has to talk about this time of year. It's just part of, um, part of that time of year. Everybody's talking about Jesus, whether they want to admit it or not. And so you'll get a secular historian, maybe like a Bart Ehrman or somebody who's a, who's a religion professor at a secular college or university, and they'll bring him on, and they'll say, well, well, Bart, what do you think about Christianity? What, what should we think about Jesus during this time? And, and, and they'll probably say something along the lines of this. They'll, they'll say, well, absolutely. Jesus Christ was a historical figure. We have no doubt about that. The historical record is absolutely clear about that. But the later Christians, probably about 300 years later, decided that not only was he such a great moral teacher, such a great influential character, 
uh, maybe even did some kind of seemingly like miracle type things, but they decided, you know, we should probably worship him as a god at the, that point down the road. Um, he, he wasn't, he never really claimed to be God. They just thought he was way down the line. And I want to challenge that assumption briefly with this passage. So, this passage written in the book um, to, to this, this letter to this, this Philippian church is, um, if, if, if you want to fact check me, look, look it up on Wikipedia. Um, they're they're going to say, everybody's going to say, those same secular historians are going to say, this book was literally written by this guy named Paul of Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus being his Hebrew name. And, and this, this is the guy who wrote this book. And, and he wrote this book no later than 62 AD. And uh, these, these numbers sometimes get jumbled, but Jesus probably died uh, in 33 AD. So, we're looking at 29 years after Jesus died, Paul is writing this text. Those same secular historians, if they've done any work with the text, are going to probably tell you that they think that this part of Philippians might be Paul reciting a hymn or a creed that was really common in the churches and establishing some rapport here, reminding these people of what they already knew, maybe even a, a hymn or a creed that he taught them when he planted the church back in, say, A.D. 50 when he came to Philippi. So, now we, we backed up the time to now 17 years between when Jesus died and when this hymn or this creed began to circulate. And you see where I'm going with this? If, as, as the secular historians might want to tell us, that, that this whole idea of Jesus as God, as, as both God and man in the same person, came about 300 years after Jesus' death, resurrection, that, then, then why do we have this in our Bibles? Why do we have Paul reminding people of this, that, that Jesus was in, in the very form of God and equal with God and took on himself the form of a servant, the likeness of humanity? Why, why would this be circulating within 17 years of Jesus' death. That's amazing. That's amazing. Why would it be circulating? Maybe because Jesus really was that. His earliest followers really understood that to be what he taught. And so, therefore, it's what the church believed following that. So, it, it's, it's a historical fact. It, it, and I'll have one more layer to it just for fun. Of all the people who would be teaching this kind of thing, this, this kind of assumption about God, uh, it's, it's not the Roman people of the day who would have no problem believing uh, in a demigod or something like that. It's not the Greeks who would have no problem with it. It's Jewish men who've been trained in the synagogues, who've been told, like, never accept this kind of stuff. Never, never do anything that would diminish from God. Ne never, never do anything that would distract people from the worship of the one true God. So, people have been trained in that and are going around and saying, Jesus yeah, he's, he's equal with God. Like, that's astounding. That's amazing. So, this is the kind of thing that was, was being taught in earliest Christianity. The second thing about this passage, I just, I love about this passage, is that you'll find plenty of passages, and we're going to look at a number of them throughout this series, that tell us about the incarnation, that tell us about how Jesus um, took on human flesh, how God took on skin and became one of us. And it's amazing. There, there are all kinds of theological implications to it, but this is one of the only passages in Scripture that tells us what he thought about it, how he felt in his heart of hearts about doing that. And you, and you see it here in, in verse 6. It says, he did not consider. He waited in his mind. He thought about the implications, pros and cons. And he did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Isn't, isn't that amazing? Like, we're, we're getting to see the very heart of God. And I, I know sometimes it's easy for us as, as Christians to wonder, like, how does, how does God really feel about me? Does, does God really want me to, to be part of His family? I mean, I, I'm, I'm a pretty miserable excuse for a Christian plenty of days, and, and I, I let God down in so many ways, and I, I've, I've got to surely disappoint Him in, in so many ways. Maybe, maybe he just begrudges this whole having me as part of his family. Maybe he's just really 
bummed out that he, you know, he didn't get somebody better. You know, maybe, maybe he likes other people better than me. And, and what I would remind you of, Jesus considered all of that, and he said, I'm not going to hold my, uh, my, my existing in the form of God as something to, to wield with power. I'm, I'm willing to let that go and, and to, to pull in this other form, this, this humanity, and take that up. And I, I struggle to even make a parallel to this, so, so I'm going to try a very, very fleeting attempt to do that. Um, when, I, when I think about this, I, I think about um, when, when my first daughter was about to be born, and I had been driving around in an F-150 that I absolutely loved. Um, some of you guys might relate to this. Um, and there came this conversation with my wife where she said, Phil, you got to take the Civic. And, th- and there was part of me that... Uh, deflated in that conversation. Um, there, was, there was part of me that uh, felt like I, I basically surrendered my man card. Um, and to, to even just visualize myself driving around in a Civic uh, was, was a very difficult thing. And I, I had to consider, I had to weigh the options of this scenario, of what this would do to my ego, of, of what this would do to, to so much of my life, and being able to have a truck. Um, but I let go of the truck, took up. Now, see, this is where it's different from Jesus. Jesus was actually able to, to, to hold both. But um, took up the Civic and became a Civic guy for a good number of years until we had to upgrade to a van. And so now I drive around in this Ford Edge uh, and still, still have this, this part of my soul that's missing not having a truck. Okay, okay, can, can, you, can, you, can you understand? Now, now, why was I okay with giving up the, 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 the Ford and going and getting into the Civic? Why was I able to do that? It's because my, my love for my not yet born Lane Marie was greater than, than, my, than my hatred, my uh, humiliation of driving around in a Civic. Now, why would it be that Jesus, when he weighed the options of should I be, take on humanity or not, chose to take on humanity? Well, it's because he weighed the options and said, my, my love for you, my, my desire to bring salvation to you, even it, it far outweighs the humiliation, the indignity, the inconvenience of taking on human flesh. My heart for you is that big. Wow, is right. Man, doesn't, doesn't that bring comfort to you when, when, you're, when you're struggling and wrestling with that and saying, hey, maybe God doesn't love me. He does love you. That's his heart of hearts. And so just, just a few reminders as we look at this idea. We have this theology of Jesus being God and man. Well, what do we do with that? How does that change our lives? If Jesus is really God, then I can live first with confidence. Confidence, because like we sang this morning, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. Jesus, Jesus if he's just a moral teacher, if he was just a human being that, that was really great and really influential, really successful, um, that doesn't translate to our lives today. But if Jesus was really God, then I can have confidence in how I live my life today. I can live without fear of death. I can live with boldness and confidence because He is God. I can live also with hope. Uh, you may feel this morning, like as, as you kind of do that self-analysis, you may feel kind of hopeless sometimes, struggling with, I've just got this pattern of sin in my life and this feeling of just being trapped in this cycle of, of how I, I behave myself, how I treat others, and I just feel trapped in that. There's no light, there's no way forward, and you just feel frustrated. But if Jesus is really God, if He's really broken into our world, into this, this world of the material stuff that, that we obsess over, and He's really broken into that, then there's hope. There's hope. Christmas gives us hope because Jesus has broken in. God has taken on skin and has become one of us. Then there's hope beyond all of that. 
It also impacts how I trust God. So if, if Jesus is really God, then, then I'm not given the option of kind of half-hearted um, acknowledgement or, or appreciation. I'm, I'm not given the ability to do what liter- literary critics do with, with books or with uh, writings or with like Plato or whatever to say, wow, I, I really appreciate some of the really thoughtful, helpful things there. We're not given the ability to just appreciate Jesus. We have to trust Jesus. Because if, if He's really God come to be with us, then that means my whole life needs to change as a result. If I really believe that, then I owe Him everything. He deserves my complete allegiance. But also, if Jesus is really human, if He's really in flesh, then I can live with complete transparency. Because what? He, he knows everything about me. He knows every struggle that I've endured, every frustration that I've had, every pain, every ache. He, he knows what it feels like to have relationships disrupted. He knows what it's like to deal with sickness and pain. He knows those feelings intimately. And so, I don't need to try to pretend. I don't need to cover up and put on a veil and pretend that I'm, dealing, uh, that I, that I'm not dealing with the, the pains of life. If Jesus was really human, then I can live with dignity. This, this is something that, that I think is, is really helpful in our day. Is um, you know, why, why is it that I can, I, I can look at my humanity, look at my human body, and not hate it, and not, not want to, to get out of this body, want, not want to escape from this body, not want to, to, to um, uh, mistreat this body? Why, why would I feel that way? Why? For a Christian, you have the greatest reason of all to be thankful for the body that God has put you in, and that is because Jesus took up a body himself. He didn't disrespect human bodies and say, no, I can't take that up. He took on a human body. So, we can can respect and dignify the, the bodies that we have, and further, we can then respect not just the souls of other people, but we can respect their bodies as well and live with compassion toward others. Uh, uh, too often Christians are, uh, get, get the bad rap of, well, you just care about getting people's souls saved and you don't really care about their bodies. We can care for both because Jesus was both God and man. He took on flesh and we can then have compassion on the bodies and the physical needs of those around us. So there we see the divine human Savior and I'll end quickly with this. We need a humbled, exalted Savior. Um, every, every one of us has a trajectory to our lives. There's, a, there's kind of a direction that we're moving in that, that you can kind of measure. You can look at a workplace trajectory for an employee and see, uh, are they climbing the ranks? Are they moving, moving ahead? Or, or have they plateaued? Are they moving down in the company structure? You can, you can look at a lot of trajectories in life. I think of, when I think of trajectories, I think of that time when I was, I think it was about 11, we were playing baseball, and we didn't have enough space to have a properly sized diamond, and so we just kind of laid out some stuff in the yard that, that approximated a diamond shape, and so I was pitching, and I was not a very good pitcher, I never have been a very good pitcher, um, but I was pitching that day, and I threw probably the best pitch of my life, and it was just so incredible. I mean, it cut right across home plate, and I was just marveling in the beauty of it. Like, it, the elevation was just right. The, everything about that trajectory was just perfect. And I heard the crack of the bat on the ball, and I thought, I, I finally achieved it. And then I heard a second crack and found myself laying uh, on the ground and, and then opened my eyes probably a couple minutes later to see all these faces huddled around me, checking on me, and uh, lived the next... I don't know, three weeks or so with like a third eye right there in the middle of my forehead. <laughs> uh, the, the trajectory outbound was really great, um, but I failed to pay attention to that uh, return trajectory uh, of that baseball. And, and in, in a very similar way, there, there's an outbound and an inbound trajectory that, that the Bible shows us. Here in, in Philippians, we see the trajectory of Jesus, um, how, how He moves out. Uh, you, you see kind of in the uh, verses 6 through 8, there's kind of this downward trajectory. Form of God emptied himself, 
became, uh, came as a man, humbled, becoming obedient all the way down, death, not just death, death on the cross, a humiliating, miserable form of death. So all the way to the lowest of the lows. And then verse 9, for that reason, God highly exalted him. You see, the return trajectory from the downward goes way up, way up beyond anything estimable. And so, so we see this, this trajectory of Jesus going down then up. We also see some different trajectories in the Bible. We don't have the time to turn to all these, but in, in Isaiah 14, we see this trajectory of the, the powers of this world aligned with Satan, and we see this, this trajectory for Satan that's really an up then down. In Isaiah 14, verse 13, is he, uh, Satan basically says, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set my throne above the stars of God. And how does it end up? Verse 15 says, but you will be brought down to Sheol into the darkest regions of the pit. The trajectory of people mirrors the same thing. In Genesis 3, verse 5, um, Satan tells Eve with Adam there standing by, when you eat the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. There's a, this trajectory, this grasp for power, this, this ideal of ascending to become like God then verses 8 through 19, the results of that, cursed, 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 down, down, down. And then ending up, verse 24, God drove them out east of the Garden of Eden. This is this downward trajectory, this outward trajectory for us as humans. Um, maybe, maybe in light of that kind of trajectory, if, if you follow with me in Philippians 2, starting in verse 5, maybe we should see Maybe we'll see the picture of Jesus somewhere differently if, if we would read the text something like this. We have rejected the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. We who, not existing in the very nature of God, considered equality with God as something to be earned. Instead, we inflated ourselves by assuming positions of power, taking on the likeness of God's, and when we achieved self-made divinity, or so we thought, we exalted ourselves by becoming disobedient, fighting at every turn the natural course of death, especially shameful or painful death. And for this reason, God totally rejects us, has stripped away our names from every other name in His book, so that at the sound of our names, every finger will point in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that the Lord of heaven never knew us, and all glory goes to God the Father alone. That's the trajectory of us. That's our human trajectory, far different than the humbled, exalted Jesus that we worship. And that reminds me of this slightly paraphrased quote from Augustine. He says, do you wish to rise? Begin by descending? Do you plan a tower that will pierce the clouds, lay first a foundation of humility? We're reminded two, two implications for us. If, if Jesus Himself, God, equal with God, all of the form of God was willing to take on humanity and was willing to make this descent and then glorified after, then it changes how I approach other people drastically. I mean, that's, that's why Paul puts this in here, right? Um, in verse, uh, verse 4, everyone should not look not only to their own interests, but also to the interests of others. Uh, in verse 3, mentions the idea of humility. How we, how we respond to others, how we treat others, is vastly impacted by if we really believe that Jesus Himself was humbled and then exalted, that He took the trajectory of down and then up, which is reversed from all of our own trajectories, our, all of our own desires. It helps us to be able to say, I can take the sting of a rebuke. I can absorb a loss. I can endure suffering. I can, I can do all that so that others can receive honor. They can recover from loss. They can enjoy pleasure. I can do that in my church. I can do that in my family. I can do that in my workplace. I can endure humility and suffering and pain and loss because that's what Jesus did. And it's, it's not for an end in and of itself, it's because what's on the other side of it is far more glorious, far greater than the loss that I experience and that I see. But it also changes how I approach God. 
And, and here's, here's where I think it's helpful for us this Christmas season. As we think about the gospel for ourselves, the gospel for our community at large, if Jesus, God himself, had to take that step of humility to bring salvation to us, if, if he had to take that incredible humility to bring and offer salvation so that our, our lives and our souls might be changed and transformed, then my approach to God can't be anything less than a total emptying, complete denial, complete powerlessness, complete like Jesus, stripping away of his rights. So Jesus offers us a very simple way to himself, simply through faith. But we can't have that faith so long as we hold on to our rights, hold on to our dignity, hold on to our self-worth, hold on to all these things that we think make us powerful and inflated and capable. We have to lay it down. We have to approach God the way Jesus approached us. And that changes everything. Christmas changes everything. And it's in the light of that that we should guide our thoughts and guide our hearts to how we approach others and how we approach God this Christmas season. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have made a way for us. We thank you that your heart is not against us. Your heart is not uh, filled with frustration with us as we um, so often let you down and feel, feel like we have disappointed you in some way. We thank you that in Jesus we see that you, <laughs> you considered equality with God, not something to be exploited held on to, fought for at all costs, but you were willing to take on humility, take on our humanity to bring us salvation. You did that because you loved us. I pray that everyone in here this morning, uh, as, as we walk out, as we go out into our lives, can realize uh, what the prophets say about you, that you are singing over us because you delight to have that relationship with us. You delight in your children. And, and I pray that that would, that would stir our hearts, that would give us hope, that it would help us to live with confidence when we feel in despair, that, that you would help us to live with transparency and not, not feel that we have to hide and feel guilty about ourselves, that we, we would feel joy in the fact that you are our salvation. You have changed everything in this Christmas season. That would be at the forefront of our thoughts and hearts. I pray that that would be deeply embedded in our hearts this week and throughout the rest of the weeks of this Christmas season. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to close with a song that is very fitting to much of what Phil brought to us this morning. This we know. It opens with, you are who you say you are. You'll do what you say you'll do. You'll be who you've always been to us, Jesus. So I invite you to stand as we sing this song. Our joy, 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 our joy
Thank you, church. Be seated. Chastine. Thank you, Brent. And so what a great reminder this morning. Thank you, Phil, that, you know, Jesus is so much more than we could ever think or imagine. What he's done on our behalf, his finished work on the cross, and the, the example he demonstrates through his humility. And Lord, we, we're just thankful that God is good and that he made a way for us in him. And so this week, as we go out, we'll be reminded as this holiday season is upon, we have a great opportunity to make much of Jesus in light of all the folks we're going to interact with at the stores, at work, and every, everywhere around us, we have a great opportunity. And as I've mentioned before, we're made for this. God has called us to himself, and we're, this is our time. This is a great opportunity to make much of Jesus. I want to encourage you in that. And so some of the ways we do that, uh, we've mentioned to you before about our one mission offering is how we, we are collectively with our network of churches um, taking an offering that, you know, this is our big push for it, but it's, it can be done throughout the year. You can give throughout the year. But now that this December season, we, uh, we have a goal of $5,000. It's a big goal total. I think I, I forget the total number, Phil. It's, it's 125 or something like that between the three churches. And so we want to make... Uh, this opportunity to to go and send out. I mean, you had uh, Bryce. I think we mentioned this before, but Bryce came and preached a, a couple months ago for us. He's up in Canada, um, up in Halifax, and so you know things like that. We want to be a part of. We want to be a part of sending out to make much of Jesus, and so we want to encourage you in that. Um, also, a reminder: December fifth, the celebration dinner we're having with our network of churches next Sunday. Thank you guys for signing up. Uh, we're encouraged. We're stoked. I mean, there's a couple hundred people. I think close upwards of 300 people are going to be a part of this, and we're super stoked. I mean, I think we have about 30 or so from our, our church, and that's awesome. We're super stoked, super, super stoked. So thank you for doing that. It's going to be a great time. And then one more reminder as we go out this week. I know we had our Thanksgiving week this week, but we have small groups. So Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, there's some cards in the back, but we want to encourage you to take advantage of an opportunity to be connected and be united with with other with like-minded believers, and want to encourage and hold each other accountable. So take advantage of that this week. Again, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. I think we all start at 6:30. We're done by eight. So we want to encourage you to make that a part of your week. Okay. And so as you go out, again, the gospel goes with you. And church, we love you. We're thankful for you. We're made for this. Let's make much of Jesus. You are dismissed. <laughs>